so our first speaker um, is Professor Anthony Paxton from the National Physics Laboratory and King's College London, who is going to talk to us about reliable ab initio methods. So, welcome. Oh, I need to wire up. You do, yes. This is my opportunity to embarrass Harry very slightly by saying thank you very much for the support and encouragement that you've given me over the years. I think Harry has the same vision that Hume Rothery had, the notion that at the heart of physical metallurgy lies the electron theory. And it's very notable that already there are two electron theorists speaking at this symposium, which is something that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. 20 years ago, one would have to show a couple of slides explaining what is meant by the density functional theory. And nowadays, that's hardly necessary. People seem to know what it is. Um, the point is, of course, that the, uh, that the electrons form the glue which holds the atoms together in, in, in any piece of condensed matter. And so that's uh, the, nature of, uh, of the situ nature of the situation in both chemistry and, and physics and physical metallurgy. Any study of condensed matter, one has to solve the Schrodinger equation for the electrons which are holding uh, the nuclei together and uh, ultimately that um, has to be what's responsible for the mechanical properties of a material. And um, this is done through the density functional theory. It's interesting, so Igor Abrikosov uh, on uh, when was it? Monday explained that the density functional theory was first produced in 1965. Interestingly, that's also the date that Jack Christian's first edition was published, and he had a, a similar vision of, uh, of, of the nature of the importance of, of electron theory. It's also about the same time that Hume Rothery wrote um, of the extraordinary difficulty in obtaining a, um, a quantitative theory that, that could be used in the design of, uh, of metals. Um, and indeed, he was right in the sense that the DFT really took another 20 years or nearly 30 years before it became established that, that, that it could be usefully used in, in, in the contexts um, that interest us today. And my own work over the years has been in, a, in an abstraction of density functional theory into a model which we call the tight binding theory. And this has the benefit that it's a great deal more efficient computationally and in some sense also gives greater insight into the nature of, of chemical and physical bonding. And, and that's mostly what I want to talk about today. I mean, from a technical point of view, the tight binding approximation, um, instead of constructing a Hamiltonian self-consistently and ab initio, um, which is actually the title of this talk, um, uses an approximation, uses a lookup table um, of, of parameterized matrix elements. So um, I'll talk a little bit about pure iron, but what's important and what, in my view, has created the breakthrough, even in these last few years, which has not been possible up to now, is to, is to study and, and model carbon in iron, which means that we are now able to study steel. And I think government has taken this on board, at least in, in other countries. So the Max Planck Society has established a huge one or two new directorates in the Dusseldorf Institute to, to create a, an environment for the modeling of steels. And a lot of the work is being done elsewhere in Germany, in Sweden, in, in, in the United States. So those of you that are policy makers, I would urge you to consider that the UK now needs also to come to the forefront of this kind of work. Um, the, challenge, uh, uh, the challenge for me, to one extent, of carbon in iron was, 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 was creating models and, and, and understanding the, the phenomenon which are very well known to you, namely that, that, that carbon um, is associated with the octahedral site in the dilute limit of BCC iron, but in uh, in the concentrated limit, if you were to make a fictitious um, FEC phase in the BCC structure, then the, the carbon would be in the tetrahedral sites. And uh, at some concentration, um, one, you know, the, 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 uh, the system goes over to preferring the octahedral sites with the associated tetragonal distortion that one encounters in Martin site that's very well known. So uh, the, 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 the carbon acts something rather like what the physicists call a polaron, in, in which there is a, a dipolar force uh, which uh, reorients through 90 degrees as, as, as the carbon diffuses. I'll show you something about that shortly. Um, even more unusual and, and striking is that in austenite, in the FCC phase, the same thing happens, so that the carbon occupies the octahedral sites in the dilute limit. But if you, again, if you were to make an FCC, FEC, uh, non-existent, it'd have a positive heat of formation. If you were to make that crystal, it would have the zinc blend structure, not the rock salt structure. 
and the carbon would prefer the tetrahedral site, even though that interstice is considerably smaller uh, than the octahedral site in FTC. And you might be tempted to think that the reason for that is that carbon likes some sort of sp3 bonding environment as it does in diamond and so it prefers the situation of having four neighbors rather than six neighbors even though the, 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 the site available is, is that much smaller and the, the crystal expands accordingly and one needs models and one needs to understand this density functional theory uh, describes that situation perfectly well the challenge is to find models uh, quantum mechanical models such as the type binding model that do the same Hydrogen, there are similar questions. Uh, hydrogen is rather different in the sense that in, in the BCC structure, it always occupies tetrahedral sites uh, at, at concentrated and in the dilute limits. Um, and again, we need to be able to describe that. I want to start off with a, uh, a chart that I saw a few years ago, which I found quite striking. These are density functional calculations um, done by a, a group with very high respectability. Sidney Yip is one of the authors of this paper. And they calculated, using the density functional theory, the formation energies and the configurational entropies of a large number of complexes, defect complexes, particularly uh, containing either carbon or, or vacancies. And then they plot in this, uh, in this diagram what would be the concentrations of these defects um, through uh, thermodynamic argument, through minimization of the free energy, um, as a function of carbon concentration. This is at 160 degrees centigrade and so up here around here this, this right hand end one has uh, the sort of medium and low carbon and high carbon steels and what's striking is that the, what you might call the, the naked vacancy essentially is non-existent as you'd expect um, and any vacancies that do occur uh, will be decorated by exactly two carbon atoms and so the dominant defect is, as far as vacancies are concerned um, now I don't know if you find this striking or if everybody knew this already but I was surprised at that so that you might even state quite st strongly and firmly that apart from the, the, the overwhelmingly dominant defect, which is the carbon in the octahedral site, all vacancies in just about all carbon steels are decorated with two carbon atoms. Is that well known, Henry? It is well known. So, of course, that must have uh, uh, consequences for, for, for diffusion and, and, and so on. So what I wanted to do um, in the next few slides is to try to study this complex and uh, you using the the type binding methods. But before I do that, I wanted to just show you um, some, some results from the type binding modeling just to show you can see what, what, sort of, um, what sort of things the type binding can do. So um, here, for example, are calculations of the, the bulk modulus and the two shear constants, the uh, internal energy difference between HEP and BCC phases in, in, in iron. Um, this is the formation energy of the vacancy. This is still quite controversial. So um, this is just a technical term, generalized gradient approximation. That's, uh, but this is density <coughs> functional theory here. And, uh, and, and there are two sets of experiments. And I'm, I'm using the, the experimental data from Zeger. And, 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 there's a, uh, and he's very, very firmly of the opinion that the, that the formation energy of the vacancy in iron cannot be greater than 1.85. But there are other experiments that, 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 have, that report a value of about 2, which is closer to the density functional result and then here are some data from the uh, from the type binding models that we've produced and here we have the migration energy for the vacancy and again one can compare experiment with the um, density functional theory and there's a significant discrepancy so there still is um, you know there's still the fact is that the density functional theory um, doesn't always get things absolutely right but it's the best that we can do at the moment um, in the sort of more concentrated limit this was very gratifying here we calculated um, these, these are data taken from a paper from, uh, uh, from GIFT uh, in, in Korea. Also, Harry was an author of this paper in which you calculated the, 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 the structural parameters of the of cementite and also the epsilon ion carbide phase. And just to show that these are in extremely good agreement with the uh, experiment, but also that our, our type binding models are also able to predict uh, the structure of cementite, which is extremely important. I think this is what I mean by having you know, a, a fairly recent breakthrough in the, in the modeling of steel, that we have now models which are quantum mechanical and, and, and reliable. Here are some data in electron volts. This is the migration energy of the carbon atom in, in the alpha phase. In other words, it's the energy difference between the octahedral and the tetrahedral sites in the dilute limit. These are the type binding compared to the, to the density functional theory. These are the binding energies of uh, all in electron volts of one and two carbon atoms to a single vacancy. And these are the migration energies of, of carbon in the, in the gamma, in the austenite. And 
you might imagine that like hydrogen, the carbon took a, a double hop through the neighboring tetrahedral site, but it doesn't. It just forces it way through, forces its way through a nearest neighbor bond through the D saddle point um, in a single hop, and that has a lower, a lower migration barrier. That's quite surprising. I'll show you a picture of that later on. Now, what we do quite often is we, we uh, show energy volume curves to compare um, with either experiments or with, uh, or with uh, a better theory. So here's the, the density functional theory. These are a number of different um, phases of the composition Fe3C. Um, these are some um, high energy phases that we invented. These are quite significant. These are here we have, we're showing in these curves here and these curves here, some substitutional phases, and it's significant that the tight binding theory is not good at, um, at, at representing the substitutional phases um, compared to a, a more accurate quantum mechanical theory. But what's very gratifying, and I was very pleased to find, is that we do very faithfully reproduce the, um, the formation energies and energy volume curves of the important um, carbides, the epsilon and the, and, and the cementite. And, um, let me just now show you a diagram of, the, um, of this object which I talked about uh, earlier on, the, the combination of two, two carbon atoms and a vacancy. So the vacant site is in the middle of this cube here, and the carbon atom, or indeed a hydrogen atom, would never occupy the vacant site itself. The, the, as you saw a moment ago, there's a very um, high penalty for producing substitutional phases. And so they occupy uh, their respective octahedral sites here, um, but there's more to it than that. The, um, these two carbon atoms form a molecule. The distance, the bond length here, is about the same as the bond length in diamond. It's, all, it's exactly the same as the bond length in diamond. And you might ask yourself, what's going on here? I mean, Pedro mentioned a while ago that some people think that even hydrocarbons will form inside steel. And we had an interesting talk, the last talk of yesterday, that what happens when you dissolve fullerenes, when you put bits of carbon or or carbon molecules into, in, into steel, what happens <coughs> of course, they turn into carbides because this bond is short, but it's not as strong as a, a, as a carbon bond in diamond. You might ask what happens when you, when you take a hydrogen molecule and you dump it into, in, into a metal. Uh, the the S-bands of the, or the S-states of the, of the hydrogen molecule are below uh, the D-bands of the transition metal, and so they will be occupied with two electrons, and so both bonding and anti-bonding levels are filled, and the molecule breaks apart. There's no motivation to form a bond anymore. That's, that's why hydrogen dissociates on the surface of a metal. And something similar you might expect to happen uh, when you do the same thing to carbon. But there, the carbon, uh, the carbon S and well, certainly the carbon P levels and the transition metal D levels are all mixed up together. It's less obvious that you're going to quench out the saturated bond. But to some extent, it happens. But nevertheless, you do form a bond. And interestingly, this is the configuration that's finally arrived at, both in the density functional theory and in the tight binding theory. And you can see why that is, because the carbon atom in this orientation can form three further bonds, not with hydrogen atoms, as if it was trying to form um, ethane, that would be, wouldn't it? But with, the, with, with its neighboring iron atoms. And these bonds are all of exactly the same length as well. So this is ultimately the structure that you'd expect to see in that uh, defect complex that I mentioned a moment ago. Very quickly, I can just show you no movies, so I just show you the, uh, the snapshots. This is, this is uh, carbon diffusing an austenite. So there's a little carbon atom peeking out here, and it's just pushing its way through. It's almost as if at the saddle point you have AAA stacking, which is always regarded as a heresy in metallurgy at the point of the saddle point, and there the carbon atom is poking its way through. So it doesn't hop first to a tetrahedral site and then onto the next octahedral site. It just forces its way straight through a nearest neighbor bond between two iron atoms. I don't know if that surprises you, but it surprised me. And here's this polaron moving, which is the physicist's way of thinking about a carbon atom in ferrite, in which you get this large uh, distortion because the octahedron is not regular in BCC, and so these two uh, carbon, uh, iron atoms are pushed aside here in the OO1 direction, but once the carbon has migrated, the distortion is now in the OO1 direction. This is what I mean by orienting the false dipole. And so this is a, you know, to a physicist, the carbon as it diffuses in iron is carrying this polar on with it. And this is something that, uh, that we're able to, to, to calculate and to, and to, and to simulate in, in the tight binding theory. This, is, this sequence of snapshots is, is, is what we call the minimum energy path, so the path that the, that the particle takes along the minimum energy as it rises to the saddle point and then falls down into the next minimum. 
I'll move now to hydrogen in, in, in iron. These are all type binding calculations, and everything I'm going to show from now on is based on these, on these two diagrams. So take it or leave it. But what we've done is here we have, um, it's just a position here, we have taken a, a lattice of iron atoms in the BCC structure, and we've placed a hydrogen atom in the tetrahedral site, and then we've relaxed the iron atoms around it, and then we've kept the iron atoms frozen, and we've moved the hydrogen around, calculated the potential energy, the total energy, and we've plotted it in a diagram like this. And then we've run a second calculation in which we've moved the origin here now. So here's the, here's the center of the, uh, of the tetrahedral site. Now we've got a tetrahedral hedral site here and here, and we've placed the hydrogen atom in the saddle point. We've relaxed the iron atoms around it, and then we've done the same thing again. We've, we've, uh, we've mapped out the potential energy surface. So that's, um, that's the unsatz from which everything else follows. What we're trying to do is to calculate the diffusivity of hydrogen in iron, thank you, five minutes. So we do that using Feynman's path integral theory. Uh, some of you will have read Feynman's beautiful book on quantum electrodynamics. He wrote a, a popular book, and then he also wrote a very difficult book on statistical mechanics. But ultimately, the partition function of a quantum mechanical system, according to Feynman, can be mapped onto a classical chain of beads. So a single particle moving in some potential V has a partition function which is mapped onto a classical partition function of a string of beads which are joined by spring constants of this strength and have a kinetic energy. And this becomes exact in the limit of a large number of beads. One's interested then in an integration over all possible paths. It reminds you of the QED notion that, or the principle of least action or Fermat's principle where when a photon takes a path from here to here, it actually knows somehow in its mind all the different possible paths that it can take and it calculates the action along each path and then it takes the path of the minimum action. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> and here is the quantum mechanical action here. Uh, beta here is, is 1 over kT, the temperature. So once you know the partition function, you know everything, because then you can calculate the free energy. And you can also calculate the, part, the position probability density from that. And now we can see a very strong and stark non arrhenius behavior in the free energy of the migration of a hydrogen atom from one tetrahedral site to the other, it's not constant. So at high temperature, it, there is a classical behavior, but at low temperature, uh, the barrier itself is reduced through quantum mechanical tunneling. And there's a reasonable comparison here with the experimental data. So if we want to calculate the diffusivity of hydrogen and to assume it as acting as a classical particle, you would, um, you would fall into a significant error. Now, the second strand is the theory of Gregory Voss, he also follows Feynman in, in defining a constrained, uh, a constrained partition function uh, through this constrained density. And then the, we have something called the quantum transition state theory, rate constant. Now, this is a mistake. There shouldn't be a C here. So it's a ratio of a constrained partition function and a total partition function at the reactance state. And then uh, one can use a velocity here from a Maxwell distribution. And so one can predict the uh, transition rate for the, um, for the quantum mechanical tunneling. Um, these show the particle probability density distributions for the particle at high temperature, about 1,000 Kelvin, down to low temperature, about 20 Kelvins. And you can see that even at high temperature, the particle at the equilibrium tetragonal uh, site is quite widely distributed. Uh, it actually becomes focused down to a, a narrow distribution at low temperature, which is counterintuitive. And then even more striking is at high temperature, um, the particle, when it's constrained here, this is, uh, when we've constrained the partition function, then its particle probability density is, is distributed around the saddle point at high temperature, but it's still quite widely distributed. It's not a point particle. Uh, but at low temperature, very strikingly, the proton splits into two, and one has a tunneling state. It's practically located at the, at the uh, tetrahedral sites themselves. There's no probability density, actually, or oh, very little, actually, at the saddle point. And so from that, we can calculate, if we know the, uh, the transition probability, the transition rate, we can calculate with the Einstein equation. We just have to take one-sixth of that and divide by the hopping distance squared, and we have the uh, diffusivity. So we plot here the diffusivity as a function of temperature, and these are our data here, the path integral quantum transition state theory, which is not a straight line. It's non arrhenius The experimental data are always plotted as straight lines because that's how the experiments work. You try to extract a prefactor and, a, and, a, um, a, a, and, and a, an energy barrier, and then, and, and then, you, and then you plot those on an ordinary uh, Arrhenius-type diagram. But it's certainly striking that uh, we get um, consistent agreement with experiments, certainly at high temperature. I won't say anything about these. These are theoretical calculations by uh, uh, other people called centroid uh, 
molecular dynamics. I won't go into that. But um, we're very gratified that, that we can predict, this is ab initio, the diffusivity of hydrogen as a function of temperature. So I think it's best if I just leave you with the conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you've uh, achieved something remarkable, which is to convince an engineer that quantum mechanics is actually relevant to, to something to that I do. So, so thank you very much for that. I'm used to ignoring anything I smaller think it was than a Rothery did that so, uh, than me. so I'm sure we've got lots of questions. Um, yes, there at the back. The approach you've got is um, for vacancy defects you've shown. Can this be extended to the structure you find in a grain boundary to predict either diffusion along a grain boundary or the stability of, uh, say, boron to remain at a grain boundary? Obviously, you need to know the structure of the boundary to, to do that. But are, are there, is that possible or is it? We've started to do calculations like that of the diffusivity of hydrogen along a dislocation using the same approach as here, or something similar, these, uh, something similar to the centroid molecular. That's a quantum mechanical calculation, so equally treating the hydrogen as a, as a quantum mechanical object. And because it's interstitial, I mean, I, th I suppose everybody knows that, but, but the, the, the grain boundary actually, or the, or the dislocation, doesn't provide a fast diffusion pathway, quite the contrary. So the hydrogen gets trapped, and the sites then get occupied. And so the, in, 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 in a real sense, the dislocation is an obstacle to diffusion in the case of hydrogen. So that, that probably answers the first part of your question in terms of hydrogen. Boron's another matter. Boron we wouldn't think of as being a quantum particle. The nucleus is sufficiently massive. And we have worked on boron and embrittlement in, in an earlier days. So when you say these methods, you mean density functional theory? Yes, yes. Yeah, we did. We had a rather nice letter in Nature about 10 years ago looking at the, uh, at the embrittlement of copper with boron exactly using quantum mechanical methods and trying to find the origin of it. So is the current is yes. computational power sort of up to the level where you could do a 2D defect like a, a grain boundary rather than a single Yeah, well line. we did grain boundaries, yes. It was it a grain boundary, okay. Is. It is nowadays, yes. Right, okay. Yes, this is, part, I mean, there are, yeah, this is part of the breakthrough, really, of density functional theory finally becoming, uh, you know, coming home to roost is because people now have yes. access to high-power computers, which they didn't even 20 years ago. Great, thank you. I mean, Tony, uh, you have to qualify that by saying these are special boundaries that you model. Of course. Yeah. Sorry, I should have said that. OK. Um, c going back to your carbon vacancy, yeah, the concentrations are incredibly low on yes. the plot, yes. right? Yes, they are. So, so is this of any consequence? What it means is that there are neither vacancies, there's nothing except hmm. carbon, inter carbon octahedral interstitials in the steel. But I mean, I you know, know. You've got I mean, here at the high, you've got quite, you know, this is, this, this is atom, atom percent, percent. So 1% carbon steel is sort of up here somewhere. So you've got. No, it's, it's 10 to the minus 8. Yeah. 10 to the minus 6. 10 to the minus yeah. 6. Or 10 to the minus 5, even. Is that significant? It's very, very small. It is. But uh, something must be producing. But, but let's assume that every carbon atom. Right. Or every vacancy. Uh, uh, every vacancy is, is uh, filled with carbon. Yeah. Uh, do you know how that would influence the diffusion of iron? We haven't done a calculation. I, I take it, I imagine that it has to, that, well, either it breaks away from it in the cultural sense or it has to carry the damn thing with it. And, um, the, and uh, these are calculations that we haven't yet made. I suppose, the, I mean, in a sense, you have to argue that if there is diffusion in iron, then this is the object that's doing it. I mean, even though these concentrations are very small, this is quite low temperature, of course. It's 160 degrees. You wouldn't expect much diffusion. Uh, we haven't, I haven't seen plots like this at higher temperature. Maybe everything then changes, and maybe these things become less prevalent compared to the naked vacancy. So I don't know. The second question is about the uh, diamond-like bond. Yeah? Yes. Um, so again, that relies on having uh, two carbon atoms quite close to each other, right? Mm. Uh, and we know that actually if they approach much closer, then there's a strong repulsion as well. Yes. So, I mean, the chances of this happening are very, very small, right? Well, I, I don't know, Harry. I mean, if you were to place, if you were Maxwell's demon and you came up to a vacancy with two carbon atoms in your pocket and you placed one of them here and one of them there and then you went away, they would move together. But, I mean, those are not the nearest neighboring sites, actually. These here, you mean? Yeah. It could have one here and one there. Right. Exactly. That's what we have here. Hmm. Yeah. You, if you placed one of them here and one of them there, then they would again move together. I mean, this is the ground state here. 
So, I mean, I think what you're saying is, yes, of course, in, in all of the theory of chemical bonding, you have, if you like, you know, a curve that looks like this. You have some attractive part and some repulsive part. Yeah, so if, if you, you get the nearest neighbor... Yeah, but that's all included in here. This is all included in the quantum mechanics, so we're not leaving anything out there. This is the ground state no, of this No, what system. I'm saying is mm. that there is experimental evidence... Right. ...you know, from snook effects and mm. so on, mm. that the carbon atoms do not occupy the nearest neighboring sites. Is there? No, I didn't yeah. know that. That's very interesting. I was, I was, I was going, I mean, I, I assume that somebody now has to do some internal friction to see if these exist. So where would you think, I, if I gave you the pointer, you could show me where the carbon atoms are likely to sit? Well, the octahedral interstices yeah. are located half A mm -hmm. apart, mm -hmm. uh, but the carbon atoms never occupy. So you mean in a, state, a situation like this? Yeah. Right. But that's not exactly what this phase diagram is telling you. The phase diagram is telling you differently, isn't it? If you believe the density functional theory, then it's telling you that, uh, that this, is a prev this is the most prevalent defect. I mean, they've compared, this is, this is, there's a binding energy for this thing. So they've also considered two of these traps and one of these, and then this is the binding energy. So this is a prevalent defect. I mean, you're saying they're not nearest neighbors. Then, of course, you could have two of these and one of those, which are separated a long way away. But that actually has a higher internal energy than this structure here. There is a, and this is what I showed in this table here. So here you have the binding <coughs> energy of two carbon atoms to a vacancy. It's positive, one electron volt. So if you've got two carbon atoms in, in the matrix and you've got a vacancy, then you gain one and a half electron volts if you put the two, those three objects together. My question is, is this an artifact of small numbers of atoms being modeled? No, I don't think so. It might be, but because we, you know, as we get bigger computers, we can use bigger systems. But this is what we call convergence tests in the business, and we're fairly careful that we make bigger. I mean, you've done these things yourself in, in GIFT and so on. You know, you've done this somewhere. We make bigger and bigger cells until things converge. They're difficult calculations, and especially for the density functional theory, you have to work quite hard. And that's why I like type binding. My contention is that type binding is just as good as density functional theory. That's why we can throw away, we can cut the apron strings of density functional theory, and you can follow me to the world of type binding. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, oh, yes. Do we, do we have any from online? My, um, my, my um, thought on, on, the, um, on, on your prediction that, that two carbon atoms always go, go with a vacancy is that any measured, uh, any, me any actual measurements of vacancy diffusivity must already include the effect of those carbon atoms, which is very different. It's virtually impossible to exclude carbon from a, from a practical ion, ion composition. So could any, could a variability in those uh, vacancy diffusion measurements um, be accounted for by, by variations in the carbon con um, composition of the metal? Well, let me first say this is not my prediction. This is the prediction of the MIT group. That first slide I showed is not my own work. That's uh, work that I happen to find in the literature. So um, I was astonished to find this heated debate around, well, well, this is the formation energy of the vacancy, so that's slightly different. But here we have the migration energy. Uh, my understanding is that that's pretty well agreed. I know I took that from Zeger, I think. I think there are, yes, the people who believe that that is the, the people who believe that the formation energy is about two electron volts, I think that's the Scandinavian school, they believe that the migration energy is much, therefore, much, much smaller, uh, something closer to this value. Um, and then Zeger takes the view that we have this for the formation energy and this for the migration energy, and both those data put together consistently will give you roughly the same diffusivity. Now, whether carbon is involved, my understanding is that they are very, very careful to produce the purest iron crystals that they can. This is the game that they play in Stuttgart. But I, I mean, I'm not fully sure, but I'm sure Zeger thought of this, so don't you? But they're still hotly debated. I was amazed, but the experimental people do not agree. These are, these are difficult calculations because the BCC phase is only stable at low temperatures. It's very hard, actually, to measure the vacancy concentration because it's so small. Uh, below the A1 temperature. So um, I think, I, I don't know the answer to your question. It's, it's a question for the experimenters, I think, rather than 
for us. We can do the sort of calculations that Harry proposes and we can start moving the vacancy with its carbon atoms, you know, finding the minimum energy path and uh, trying to calculate. Uh, of course, the prefactor would be half. You've got some collective vibrational mode which is pushing the thing up towards the saddle point. So it'll be a, a lengthy calculation. So ask me in a year's time or so. Sorry, does that answer? It doesn't answer the question, but it just says I don't know in a very long-winded way. Any other questions? All right, well then, I'll move on to introduce our last speaker. Um, thank you very much for that talk. That's very uh, new.